Hi, and welcome to my OCRA A-Level Biology Revision Session with me, Christine. So today's lesson, I want to look at epistasis, which is part of your Patterns of Inheritance topic area. So what is epistasis? Well, epistasis is an interaction of genes at different loci, which are going to affect the phenotype of the organism. So it can be dominant epistasis. Now, if it's dominant epistasis, what it means is that a dominant allele at one locus may mask the phenotype of a second locus. So what do I mean by that? Well, I went to the pumpkin patch the weekend and I identified that there were different colored pumpkins available. Now, what you should understand is there are different genes that are involved in the color that we see in a pumpkin. So if we look at gene A, if a individual has a dominant allele, that means there will be no pigment whatsoever being produced for that individual. If it is a recessive allele, so therefore if they have two of the recessive alleles, then pigment will be put into the flesh of the pumpkin. Now, there is a second gene, gene B, which is, if it's dominant, going to give the colour orange, and if it's recessive, will give the colour green. So how is it that a gene is going to interact with a different gene. Well, the gene A, the one that is going to result in no pigment, could potentially result in the production of a repressor protein. Now, if it's a repressor protein, what that's going to do is, if there is the dominant allele present, the repressor protein is going to be produced, that is going to block RNA polymerase from binding at the promoter region for gene B. So this is one way in which epistasis could be occurring. The other thing is that it could be that instead of producing a repressor protein, instead the dominant allele A, obviously that is the one that's being expressed, that's the one that's interacting for those characteristics, that is resulting in an inhibitor molecule being made. Now, if there's an inhibitor molecule being made, that is going to bind to an enzyme involved in the pigment production pathway and therefore affect the shape. So it could work in the same way as a non-competitive inhibitor would do in that if this molecule is going to bind, it is going to affect the enzyme shape because binding to the enzyme is going to change that tertiary structure and therefore by changing that tertiary structure the enzyme is no longer able to produce the pigment so therefore affecting that pathway. So if we look at dominant epistasis then and we focus on our pigments, oh, I don't like that, So if we look at this dominant epistasis and we look at it with regards to our pumpkins, we know that if we have two heterozygous individuals, we would produce four possible gamete combinations. So if you haven't already looked at my video on dihybrid crosses, then please do look at that. But the key thing to note with Mendel's law of independent assortment, if we are independently assorting these genes, we could potentially have four possible combinations. And therefore, if we were to cross two heterozygous individuals, we would therefore have a possible combination that would result in this. So if we take the heterozygous of a white individual and the heterozygous of a, another white individual. Now, why are they white? They are white because, remember, if they're heterozygous for gene A, that means no pigment is going to be produced in the pumpkin. So we take two white pumpkins and we cross them and what would then happen is we would end up with the combination, if we do our Punnett diagram, which results in us getting only three possible 
combinations that would give us our orange pumpkin and one possible combination that would give us a green pumpkin. So when we look at Mendel's law of independent assortment and we look at it with a die hybrid inheritance, we should have a nine to three to three to one ratio. Well, quite clearly we do not have that here. What we have instead is a 12 white, three orange, and one green. So a ratio which is 12 to three to one. So if the ratio with doing a dihybrid cross with two heterozygous individuals does not give us a nine to three to three to one ratio, that could indicate epistasis. So the 12 to three to one ratio is showing us that we have dominant epistasis. Now, if the pigment for the recessive trait wasn't green and instead was white, that would actually give us a 13 to three ratio. So that's another ratio that we could obtain that indicates that we have got dominant epistasis. So what if it's recessive epistasis? What if we are looking at two recessive alleles and the fact that we've got these two recessive alleles one gene is going to mask the effect of another gene so in this case if we look at our labradors we can see that we have gene one and gene two so gene one is to do with the color whether they are a black lab or whether they are a chocolate lab now the dominant allele gives them the black colour, whereas the recessive alleles would be the chocolate colour. Now, gene 2 is where the pigment is going to be deposited either in the fur or prevents the pigment from being deposited. So, as you can see with gene 2, it's the one that's important here. So, we can either write it as being the lowercase, or sometimes in the exam, they might draw it as being a line underneath. Now, if there's a line underneath, that is telling you that it does not have an effect. So here we can see that if we were to use our Punnett diagram and we were to put in our potential gametes, because we expect independent assortment, what would we get? We should get a nine to three to three to one ratio. Well, actually we don't. If we put in our phenotypes and we look at our phenotypes with regards to the black lab, we can quite clearly see that we are getting a nine ratio for black labs. We would then end up with a three ratio with regards to our brown, but now we have a four ratio when it comes to the yellow fur. So we end up with a nine to three to four ratio. So this is a different ratio. It doesn't follow Mendel's law of independent assortment. It doesn't give us a nine to three to three to one ratio. Therefore, because we've got a nine to three to four ratio, that is indicating that it is recessive epistasis that is occurring here, which is resulting in the fact that two recessive alleles, gene two, if the individual has those two recessive alleles, that is masking the effect of another gene in the sense of either a repressor protein has been produced or it is a molecule which is going to bind and inhibit the pathway in some form. So I hope you've liked this video and if you have then please do click on the like button and subscribe to my channel and if you haven't already done so please do check out my revision platform www.aiqchat.com